and I'm just starting my slideshow. And you should see my uh, first slide there. So I'm Roxanne Zimmer in Cornell Bridge at Cornell Extension. I have the pleasure of training master gardeners. I think there's at least two in the room right now. Uh, if any of you have any questions, by all means, you can drop me an email at rz378 at cornell.edu. You know, I was talking to uh, Gwen before we started, and people say that they want to have more garden training, but they may not have the time to do so. So I've now developed a new course called The Joy of Gardening. And mm -hmm. if, you, if you're interested in that, by all means, uh, drop me a note. And that brings us to what we're talking about tonight. This is the 200th anniversary of Frederick Law Olmsted's birth. And across the country, as Rick was noting, there are celebrations, recognitions, and all kinds of events that are going on. You can certainly go to the national page and see what is happening. I believe Planting Fields is having a program next month. When I started to explore this in my context, I said, what would be a great way to organize key ideas about Frederick Law Olmsted and his legacy. And I said, let's go for a walk in Olmsted Parks and I'll take you through a few of them and talk about his signature features. One of the things Olmsted was fond of saying was, a park is a work at art, of art. You can see it here, Bow Bridge in Central Park, particularly in the fall. It's spectacular, but I want to remind you that this is all created. This is, as Olmsted would call it, scenery that he put together for our enjoyment. You may have seen photos of Olmsted the Younger. My guess is this is the one most often used, but I'm very partial to this portrait by Serge. And what I like about it is that it shows you Olmsted, where he really wanted to be. See how he's standing there among the flowers, among the bushes, among the shrubs? Well, take a look at where he lived, okay? This guy had plants growing absolutely everywhere on around his house. And, I, and we'll go back to his house uh, before we're through tonight. Olmsted was born in the 1820s in Hartford, Connecticut. He spent time on Staten Island as a gentleman farmer. He was a very good writer uh, and engaged in uh, some abolitionist work. He also took a job in Washington, D.C. as a sanitation engineer. But it's probably from the 1850s forward that we know him in this field that had yet to be described as landscape architecture. Now, I was trying to put my head around how am I going to focus this. I said, well, what has Olmsted done around the United States? I invite you to do the same. You can go to the National Park Service map. And you see, wow, there are a lot of green Olmsted dots. And I said, but it wasn't very helpful. Let me drill down. And I said, Long Island. There are the Olmsted projects. You see Southampton has a few, uh, Bayard Cutting down on the South Shore. But many, you see from all those dots, were on the Gold Coast on the North Shore of Long Island, some in, in uh, uh, Montauk as well. So you can take a look and drill down further and actually get the addresses of these sites. So a lot of work was done. Now, how is it that he accomplished so much? Yes, Olmsted did a great deal in his lifetime, but his work was carried on by Olmsted brothers, his son and son-in-law, and then up until 1979, Olmsted Associates. That's really a long arc of over a hundred years of Olmsted work. Certainly he was a visionary and his legacy is in many places that we don't even see. You know, you go up to Mount Royal in uh, Montreal, that was his effort. I'll take you to uh, Niagara Falls and many other places. Um, national and state parks were informed by his vision. Many college campuses were as were private estates, but we're gonna focus for the most part tonight on his urban parks. Yosemite, when he was out there doing uh, a report, 
provided him a context to put words on paper, writings about two key ideas that will inform everything he does thereafter. Um, the National Park Service uses this today as one of their critical documents, but I'm gonna drill down to two key points. Olmsted said, you know, scenery, and that's what he called nature, if you will, has a power on men and women. It can relax them. It can focus them. It can put everything in a better perspective. So in some sense, he was kind of ahead of his time recognizing, my goodness, it's wonderful and beneficial for the human spirit to be out walking in the natural world. A second key idea that he uh, described in that paper for the national parks was that places of unusual or extraordinary beauty should not only be carefully maintained and preserved, but it should be public, that everyone should be allowed to go to these places. What's interesting is that it's a certain irony in the ideas he had in the 1860s. These were largely met with indifference. It would take about another 30 or so years for Roosevelt to declare areas as national parks or forests. Uh, and it wouldn't be until the 20th century that this part of Yosemite here would be called Olmsted Point. There were many influences on him. Some of you know the English landscape designer, Capability Brown, uh, who did the gardens of Downton Abbey, as well as Humphrey Repton. Then the American Andrew Jackson Downing was perhaps most influential in introducing him to Calvert Vox, who would be his co-collaborator on many projects uh, in cities. But I would argue it was his childhood experiences traveling around with his family in search of scenery, in search of the woods and the fields that made a difference on him. He spent obviously, because he was in Hartford, much time in the Connecticut River Valley. He roamed the Hudson River Valley and most importantly, the Adirondacks. And you will see in Central Park, in Prospect Park and many of the other places I'm taking you to, this reflection of, this reference to the Adirondacks. Now, by no means was Olmsted the inventor of a public space, right? We think of the Boston Commons early on in uh, colonial and other times as a place where the public gathered. You know, every city too, like New Haven, had its green. It was sort of the place where all the churches or houses of worship were, sometimes the courthouse uh, as well. Smaller towns would have a town square, and that usually meant that the police chiefs and the political offices were somewhere near or adjacent to that area in a downtown. While it is true, New York did have a park, Gramercy Park, and it was a beauty, but by no means was this open to the public. Yeah. You needed to this day to have what? a key to get into Gramercy Park. You need to be one of the people living on its periphery, if you will, to get in. So in Manhattan and other cities, where did people go to get this, if you will, natural experience to, to, to feel the power of scenery? They went to cemeteries. In Brooklyn, they went to the Greenwood Cemetery because it was, if you will, planted with all kinds of trees and shrubs so that not only might people honor a family member that was passed, <clears throat> they could, because it was a public and open space, wander or meander through the trees and shrubs for a sense of relief. So why was Olmsted so persuaded in the 1800s about the notion of a public park? What changed his mind? Well, in the 1850s, he went on a walking tour in England and he found himself in a place that would forever change him because it was a public park open to all classes and it was called the People's Garden. 
it's uh, known as, it was known as Birkenhead Park. And when he went there, it was only open a couple of years. And what struck him as odd was that people of every class were walking through this Birkenhead Park that had been designed in the city of Liverpool, the same place that brought us the Beatles, by Joseph Paxton. Now I remind everyone the next time they eat a banana that you can thank Joseph Paxton because it was he who cultivated the one that we eat most of all, the Cavendish. So this is what had inspired uh, Olmsted when he went there. He saw these beautiful bridges, if you will, over bodies of water trees of every kind, reflections in the water, places where one could ponder, where one could sit. And it was open to all classes. So Olmsted said, wait a minute, I live in America, a place where people have all kinds of rights. Why isn't park access something that should be a right of all Americans in a democratic place as the USA. At the time, we had nothing comparable to this English people's garden. I just want to put things in context. When Olmsted is having putting these ideas together, the Industrial Revolution is just taking hold around the world, but certainly in the US. People were moving from the countryside, whether the South or other uh, rural communities, into cities coming from uh, the surrounding area, moving to Baltimore or to Boston or to New York or to Chicago. At the same time, there are waves of immigration certainly coming to the United States cities. And as you look at this photo that I love from the Lower East Side of Manhattan, everybody who's coming is certainly um, living in, I don't want to say squalid conditions, but very crowded conditions, uh, so much so that when you think about Olmsted's idea of bringing all of these people together in a park, that constituted a very radical notion. In some ways, Olmsted was way ahead of the time saying that there should be no class distinction made among all the peoples in the United States in our parks. So what we're gonna do is take a look at these parks that I've identified here, beginning with the first of them and perhaps one of the most extraordinary, Central Park. Olmsted's features that we're going to see, his signatures, if you will, we'll see in, in uh, Central Park as well as the others I mentioned. He likes to create scenery, if you will, you, you, using grass or lawn, which we might think twice about today, wooded areas and water. When possible, he's going to use native materials, regional plants as well. He's going to use lawn to provide a sweep or a vista as an organizing feature. Another signature of Olmsted's work is what he called, or what has been called sequential experiences. Rarely are you gonna find a straight line in any of his parks. He wants people to say, hey, what's around the bend? What happens if I go up or down these stairs? And in all of this, he was trying to create what would be an antidote to urban life. So sometimes, certainly you'll see it in Central Park and Prospect Park, fifth berms that are gonna be built around the exterior of the park to even further separate those who are in the park from whatever is going on outside of the uh, park perimeter. He's also a fan of recreation and we'll see how he honors that in his uh, design. And of course, that reference to all things Adirondack. So let's go to Central Park. How do you achieve something as grand as Central Park? Well, not only did you have to have a vision, there had to be a very, very big budget. And it was thanks to Tammany Hall's generosity that they were able to put together the kind of plan that Olmsted and Vox did for this park. This is what we all tend to forget. The natural surface of that Central Park area is essentially going to be demolished. It's going to be destroyed because it's going to be replaced with an artificial surface that is going to be shaped to appear as natural. 
say it just one more time. So that what seems so natural today has been reconstructed. It is the scenery of the landscape architect, uh, Olmsted and Vox doing their work together. So they're gonna design spaces using a great deal of plant material and a rather extended plumbing system. So this is pre-Central Park. So imagine we're standing right now about where that Bethesda fountain is looking across to the Ramble. I'm gonna take you into the Ramble. You can see that, that there are not too many trees growing there uh, before Central Park was uh, developed. Here's the process of the park coming together. You see the curves going in. Take a look at that caption. More gunpowder is gonna be used in Central Park than at the Battle of Gettysburg. Hmm. And that's because in part, there is so much of that Manhattan schist that they're gonna to wanna to blow and, and move to other parts. This is a terrific book by Rosenweig and Blackmer about all of the stuff that went into the making of Central Park. And you see 25,000 trees and a quarter of a million shrubs. So wonderful to take a look at. Mm. This is that plumbing system that I was talking about that you and I as the visitor to Central Park really never get a sense of because it's all hidden out of sight below our feet. If you can go in close with your eyes, you can barely make out sort of a faint orange, faint orange lines. That's the plumbing system that undergirds Central Park. It's all over the place uh, that you see those lines guiding the water. So too much fanfare in 1857, Central Park opens, an absolute uh, beautiful place where anyone of any class is welcome to come. If you take a look at this illustration that was put together in 1860, you're reminded of that Birkenhead Park in Liverpool that I showed you earlier. You see, there's not a straight line here with the exception of the central mall in the middle, but curved lines and paths that take you around. If you also can get close to the uh, pathways, you'll see who or what is on that? You see people walking, you can see people on horseback, and you see a lot of carriages. The main paths in Central Park were designed not for the few vehicles that you see, uh, motor vehicles on them today, but for a carriage to be able to pass coming north and south. It would be wide enough to accommodate carriage traffic uh, drawn by uh, horses. So I entered this particular day over on 72nd Street on the west side. You see miles of these wonderful benches, people walking their dogs. But I like to go to the park early in the morning uh, before there's a whole lot of folks and activity going on. And I walk down to Sheep Meadow. Okay, big deal. It's a meadow, right? It's an area of lawn. It achieved what Olmsted wanted, that sense of an open vista, to make people relax and feel like they were back in the countryside, if you will, in the pasture. It's essentially a lawn, giving you that open field with trees bordering the perimeter. It looks like it's a natural lawn, right? Like it just was there, but this was full of rock outcrops. So they shaped and contoured this land to make it look relatively flat in the center with those gentle, gentle curves on either side and they put down soil and trees and grass. And this is what we all would, would need to know. Sheep Meadow in its day was mo one of the most expensive parts of the construction project, making this what we would think of as a simple field. That's how much uh, of the landscape architecture was needed to redefine this space. Uh, this is that central mall, which I absolutely love. You know, uh, Olmsted had a vision, right? He knew if he planted these beautiful elm trees as far away as they are, that one day they would provide these beautiful arcs that you see here. And um, if you go up here, there's a wonderful statement about how we're trying to protect these elms 
from uh, Dutch elm disease, uh, and they remain an absolute wonder in all seasons as a gathering spot. Uh, some of the uh, Manhattan schist was left as a, a, you know, a statement as an outcrop, which is terrific. Another innovation in Central Park, if you think about it, the design of Central Park would pretty much have blocked the streets, the 59th Street up into the hundreds. But he invented these transverse roads so that you could go from the east side to the west side or vice versa, at least at these four points in the middle of the city. If you travel, you know, next time you go to Central Park, you may hear the taxis going beneath you, but you're really not interrupted by them because of the way he designed them, not anticipating a motor vehicles as he has today, but indeed um, it does kind of distract, it's not a distraction as uh, it would be if they were within the line of our site. And then this is ice skating, right? Here we are, uh, and there's the Dakota Hotel that we can see in the distance. Um, the New York, this is New York City tap water that they're skating on. I just love these old photographs. I have to let, let you in on a secret. This was a very, I don't wanna say risque activity, but women loved to ice skate, and why? As Justin Martin reminds us, this is an, an excellent book, The Genius of Place, it was one of the few activities women could engage in without their chaperones. So the chaperones would be out there on the, you know, the side of the, uh, the uh, ice skating area and the women could travel it wherever they wanted to on the ice uh, and get out of sight, if you will, with, uh, from their chaperones. Skaters were, loved it, it was very popular. And at night they would uh, light it up with calcium lamps. So what about that sequential experience? I've said something about recreation and his uh, vistas. I know that um, Olmsted wanted to create a sense of mystery and he often would do it by building a staircase and not letting you see where it leads to. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I see it come up. Although I've been in Central Park many times, you know, I just, okay, I saw- This, this is the Central Park one if you wanna listen. Hi, whoever is, is um, I, I don't know who it is, but it, can you make sure folks that you're muted because we can uh, hear your conversations uh, as well. Thank you. So I've never been down this staircase. I know Olmsted has a surprise for me, so I'm taking it. And look what I find at the bottom of the staircase. Could not see this at the top. This is called Wagner's Cove. It's not very large, but oh, is it oh so sweet and beautiful. And oh my goodness, here is a reference to the Adirondacks in this little overhang he has here with a seat so you could come up in your boat and kind of anchor and sit here for a while or just sit here and enjoy the beauty of the lake that is behind you. Another place where I want to experience what Olmsted has in store for me is an area of the park that I never really ventured into. It's known as the Ramble. And you can see that it is the most densely treed area in all of Central Park. So I'm going to walk across Bow Bridge and head into the Ramble. Now I took a photo of this Ramble guide. It's the dark green area. I can assure you that nothing is marked up there and it changes elevation quickly. Can you get lost? <laughs> Absolutely. It's even hard sometimes to see where, where the sun is. There's some trees up there, but it's fun. And I encourage birders in particular, if you haven't been here to do so, because this is where the birds hang out. So there are wonderful uh, American sycamore and sassafras there. I saw Osage orange on the ground, all kinds of oaks, willows, tupelo, also Kentucky coffee, black cherries, and so on in the ramble. You take the steps up. Again, an aside, I'm always amazed how nature abhors a vacuum and you see these trees kind of growing in between these massive boulders. And I'm noticing that as I go in the ramble, I'm changing elevation, I'm going up there. And now I'm, wow lost. And this is exactly what Olmsted wanted people to experience. 
sense of losing yourself and just following the path through the wilderness, no matter where it takes you. And so I go and I start wandering. It's beautiful, right? You forget you're in uh, Manhattan. This is, these azaleas are absolutely a, 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 a riot of color in the spring up at the hill. And there was no natural waterfall, obviously, up here in the um, uh, ramble. So what did Olmsted do? They chiseled out that to make a little spill so you get that effect. Now remember, I was talking to one of the uh, park uh, guys who, who I met when I was walking up here and he goes, you have to remember this is all New York City tap water that is just flowing through, making it look like it's a creek or a river uh, up here in the ramble. Again, a place of beauty. And so I'm walking out of the ramble and I say to myself, can I find these features, these characteristic signature marks of Olmsted in another local park? So I head over to the next park in Brooklyn, in Prospect Park. Uh, you see this opened about 10 years after Central Park and the map looks similar in that there isn't a straight road here, right? All of the paths have that wonderful curve or set of curves to meander through and there's lots of water and you see in the center lots of or intensely, it's intensely uh, green. Not because it was naturally green, but because Olmsted would, and Vox would plant. There was a glacial moraine here that, that had been used as a uh, uh, supply for water, uh, but that was it with that, in terms of the water that was in and around uh, Prospect Park. What I like about this photo in Prospect Park, it gives you a sense of perspective. Look out across the street for a moment. You're looking at a six story walk up, but you can't see the first and the second floors, right? That's intentional because they built the berm high enough around the perimeter to give it a sense of oasis, that you're going in someplace different than the city or than the urban area. And then trees would be planted almost entirely around the edge of that berm. Prospect Park, like Central Park, would have beautiful bridges and uh, transverse roads. This is... Uh, in the day, you see sheep herding here. Lawn tennis, anyone at Prospect Park? And this is what it looks like in a typical Saturday this day. And it's just a delight to see all kinds of people in this very, very, very public place. I saw yoga classes, I saw Tai Chi, I saw all kinds of activities, baseball, softball, soccer, uh, uh, going on as you walk through the fields in Prospect Park. You and I know that this field was probably not looking like this, but this was Olmsted and Vox trying to create that sense of the pasture and openness. They made all of these gently sloping areas for their beauty. And then I went into the area that's like the Ramble, but in Prospect Park it's called, or Olmsted called it the ravine. Uh, I believe some of the uh, current signs say it's the woodlands. It is Brooklyn's only remaining forest. Lots of oaks. Again, I saw Osage, orange, and birch, and beech, and tulip trees. But this is what we need to remember. This was not a natural forest here. This was planted by Olmsted and Vox to give us that wonderful sense of scenery. I see the, the uh, characteristic steps. I'm going up. Follow the paths and I enter the ravine. Beautiful uh, boulders throughout the paths. Again, the use of man-made, if you will, water features to give you the sense of a creek that's uh, you know, rambling through the park. I must say that when I was walking through the park and I got to this spot, I was standing here a while 
And I was talking to a couple of people who said to me, it was thanks to this area of the park during the pandemic that many people found they were at ease, that they would come to Prospect Park and to these water areas often to give them a sense of tranquility with whatever else was going on in their lives uh, in, in the last uh, couple of years. Now, this is the highest point in Prospect Park. You see the graffiti up there on the uh, stones. And you get a sense then that they designed it so that the water bodies that would trickle down below this highest feature would be gravity fed. So that this beautiful pond below is fed from the New York City tap that we saw coming from that would be waterfall that's just, if you will, uh, city water piped in. These are beautiful spot spaces that uh, Olmsted and Vox created. A little further down, they have they created this uh, nice kind of spillway over uh, an Adirondack style bridge. Not we're not far from the boathouse here. Uh, the day that I was there, people were doing yoga at the boathouse. Just across from the boathouse is the low water bridge where in the 1890s, this is where ice skating happened in its day. And this is uh, a warm October day just on the other side of that. So Olmsted was successful in his design, so much so that people from every major city in the United States wanted a project uh, in their town. Boston was able to come up with uh, the money and the resources and asked Olmsted to come up with ideas to remake Boston into, to do what he did in, in uh, Central Park and Prospect Park, a variation on a theme in Boston. But what Olmsted designed is something a little different. Yes, you can see there are two major parks. Do you see on the left-hand side, those two green, big, large green uh, areas? But he did something else that I'm gonna talk about. And that's that meandering sort of stream, that waterway that goes into the Charles River. And then he would attach all of this by parkways. So let me take you to um, what Olmsted had called the Green Ribbon. This is the one thing I think Olmsted made a mistake about. People have since called it the Emerald Necklace. And I think that's a much better way to describe it than the Green Ribbon. So let me take you to uh, Olmsted's Emerald Necklace in Boston. So one edge of that into the Charles um, was four miles of what was known as the Muddy River. And the town official said, hey, let's just you know, cover this thing up and, and make it a nice park. And Olmsted said, no, that's not the right thing to do. He said, we need to keep that stream healthy and redirect it perhaps with a chain of ponds or new paths. Why was this so nasty? Well, in the day, this was where sewage went. People, you know, there was no municipal sewage system so that the waste from everybody in Boston was going into the muddy river. And they said, you know, this is the area they want to make a park. And Olmsted argued vociferously, no, this is not a park. This area is a fens and you need to call it the fens. And he said, it's a salt marsh that is no longer functioning, uh, working. Let's see if we can bring it back together. And remember he was a sanitation engineer. So he started to build sewer systems for the waste and floodgates to control that river with his hope of bringing it back to life in uh, some way. And he knew that plants played a key role. What were the plants that uh, he could add, like the beech plum and the sedges and sea buckthorn. Uh, he was very taken by Mahonia that Lewis and Clark had discovered uh, when they were west. Justin Martin credits this effort as perhaps America's first wetlands restoration, that in fact, he didn't know what he was doing, but that's what Olmsted was about with the muddy river. You can't, this is all too fine for you to see, but I just want you to have a sense of the kinds of, and the amount of plants that would go into the muddy river. And these would be his actual designs. Now, if you, you and I look more closely at that list today, we would see a lot of exotics and a lot of invasives 
that we would think uh, long and hard about introducing into a hardscape or a landscape, but not then. So this is the muddy, meandering, muddy river that he would try to bring back to life. And he did. This is what it looks like today. This is an aerial. What he did is rebanked the sides. He's going to put primitive, if you will, sewage drainage on the right side so that some of that is going to be diverted from going right in the muddy river. This is what it would look like in 1907. And this is what it looks like today. I wanted to give you a sense of that bank. The river would be uh, off to the left. And this is an aerial shot of it. So this is a wonderful river walk, if you will. Um, on both sides of the muddy river, there is vegetation and there is uh, uh, vitality. Uh, there are all these wonderful bridges using the local stone that you see here. The, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers is working on a project because a number of hurricanes have, have damaged uh, part of the sides, but they're trying to restore it. And I'll say more about uh, this headquarters in a minute, but I don't need to tell you who I saw the day that I was there taking photographs on the banks. Absolutely correct. But this Heron Olmsted was correct. He did restore this salt marsh uh, and it is functioning uh, today. An absolute delight to spend uh, the morning walking one side or the other of the river walk along the muddy river. Again, I see a, a, a steps. I know I'm almost is inviting me in. He has moved the water to make this wonderful little waterfall. And there are waterfalls in a number of places that he has uh, created for their beauty. And then it all empties or begins in Jamaica Pond, which in its day was where folks uh, ice skated. The next big spot, we followed the muddy river there, is the Arnold Arboretum. And this is a work that was done with the assistance of a number of uh, folks who were really into and understood trees, Harvard University and um, uh, Olmsted. Now, Olmsted was tasked with figuring out a way to come up with um, categories and types of trees. And so he built, if you will, you see all of those topographic lines, a series of circles and elevations where he would design this beautiful park, which would become, if you will, a museum of all kinds of, of trees from around the world. Um, Harvard wanted to charge admission. Olmsted said, no, this is still a public park. You may make a donation today, but it is still free and accessible to the public. Again, wide enough to accommodate uh, uh, carriages in both directions. And this is what it looks like uh, uh, today. You know, many, many trees uh, mature as you see here. I was delighted to see there's the uh, construction engineer, the sanitation engineer, that even in, the, in this arboretum that he's building, he's got something to address drainage. In Boston, they don't have Manhattan schist. They have a conglomerate known as the Roxbury conglomerate. The, the uh, common name for it is pudding stone. So you will see many places he uses the pudding stone through uh, the arboretum. This is the highest point. You can see Boston is about six miles uh, in the distance. And the Olmsted era trees recognizable because of, of their caliber, you know, of their trunks that you can see uh, around you. So the Arnold Arboretum with wonderful specimens from all over the world is definitely a place where you can see Olmsted at work. Then asked, uh, Olmsted was gonna design what's now called Franklin Park, not as big as Prospect Park, but close to it in that emerald necklace or that green ribbon. You get a sense that there are not as many pathways through it, but whatever you see with the exception of that one on the right, everything is a curved line. 
Well, um, the town fathers in Boston didn't want this mall like we saw in Central Park, so it never happened. But this wooded, the most wooded area did. Uh, and you see the local stone here, the pudding stone. You see the conglomerate rock, you see the stuff coming right out of it. His classic steps, take the steps and see where it leads you. Open vistas, right, punctuated by trees. As you can see, it's now become a what? A golf course. I'm not sure that Olmsted would be too happy <laughs> about the golf course, but uh, a thing of beauty. In, in this park, Franklin Park, it's called the wilderness. That area that has the rock, that has the trees where you walk in and among uh, those, those uh, trees and shrubs. I will confess to you that I wasn't in there as long because the trails were not as well marked and I was uh, decided that I need to find my way out of the wilderness uh, when I saw the next set of steps. It led down to a beautiful Scarborough pond. Uh, here's what it looked like on a nice summer day. Uh, and um, leaving the park. What you should know is that parkways were an invention not of Robert Moses, who we often think of when we hear the word parkways, but Olmsted. And they were literally to be carriage roads connecting one park to another, typically lined with elms, and they would be a pleasurable space. Uh, this was one from Buffalo, New York. I'll come back to this in a, in a couple minutes. Uh, this is what it now looks like today connecting one of Olmsted Parks with another because he did a lot of work in Buffalo. And I share this with those of you who have some connection to Brooklyn. This was Ocean Parkway, right? Connecting Prospect Park to Brighton Beach. So you see somebody in a horse-drawn carriage, some walkers and folks on bicycles. So these were Olmsted designed parkways getting you from one place to another, bucolic and wonderful. What would happen to, to many of them, as you would know, is another mode of transportation would supersede the horse-drawn carriage and they would become parkways with motor vehicles as we see here in the back bay uh, in and around the fens that we were just talking about. And this is what most of those parkways look like today in Boston, connecting one park to another. Now I mentioned, and I showed you a, an early photo of uh, where he lived. So I went to the National Historic Site where there are in fact many, many, many of uh, his records. And as soon as I turned the corner, cause I'm kind of in a suburban neighborhood, I giggled when I saw this overhang on the driveway. Again, a reference to the Adirondacks right here in, in uh, Brookline. And he had planted this Eastern hemlock years ago because he thought it might someday be a handsome centerpiece of this rather small round drive that he has. And in fact, it is. That's the background uh, of his home that you see here. Uh, this is the front door. The wisteria has been, one I <laughs> showed you before, has been cut down. Olmsted de designed his own home much as he did the parks. As you will see, there is the a steps down. He's got his own, if you will, park back front yard. And he's used the pudding stone as design and built a berm around his own place so that no one, it's again, has that sense of being isolated or separated from the rest of the world. Lots of rhododendron, that green vista, that openness and expansive feeling in the backyard, winding past there, pines, lots of evergreens, walking through the woods. This is the side of his house that you saw earlier. There had been uh, a, a Dutch a, a tree, an elm tree here that unfortunately came down in 2011. So they've planted a new elm there that has greater tolerance to uh, Dutch elm disease. Now you're looking at the back of the house and I'm gonna show you another slide to show you what's attached to the back of the house. You see all of these buildings? This is where the architecture firm was located. 
So this is where Olmsted and then Olmsted Brothers would be doing their work. And this is what it looks like uh, today. Uh, you get a sense of you know, how basic uh, uh, the spaces were in, where, in which many of those architectural rendering, renderings came from. Now I have only made uh, reference to Buffalo and you see that there are three big parks here in sort of the center of the slide and then a number of park ways that connect you to other parks. Buffalo had Olmsted there for uh, designing a lot of parks. While he was there, he rented a room at a place called the Cataract House. And he said, Vox, you gotta come over here and see this. And this is what he wanted Vox to see. That area was lined with manufacturing. All of those businesses were taking advantage of the free, if you will, hydropower, and there were mills and factories of all stripes along the Niagara River. Olmsted said, if we get rid of all of that, we will, I have a vision that there's something absolutely beautiful that we can see and share with the public if in fact we free the Niagara. And Olmsted was part of a, a movement to get rid of all of those, if you will, manufacturing spots from uh, the area. He then convinced uh, New York Governor Cleveland, Olmsted and Vox got the commission to use eminent domain to remove those mills and the amusement parks to develop paths and what we now know today as Niagara Falls. It was the first state park in not only New York, but in the United States with beautiful, handsome ways to enjoy this spectacular thing of beauty. Something that he wanted all of the public to have access to. If any of you want to know more about the many things that Olmsted and Vox did in Buffalo, by all means, take a look at uh, Francis Kowski's book, The Best Planned City in the World. So let's, uh, moving along in the timeline and getting back to uh, the greater New York area. Many people of means hired Olmsted to design their estates. And when he looked at the estates, whether it was Vanderbilt or, or uh, the Bayard Cutting uh, residence, he would essentially make them into small or miniature arboreta or an arboretum. And so when you look at today's map of the Bayard Cutting uh, property, you will see those are Olmsted's curvy lines going all over the place, just as he would have imagined but he never thought this would become a public space. How lucky we are that this came into, it's one of the New York State Parks and we can enjoy it today because the Cutting family uh, gave it over to the state. So we can, we can see Olmsted at work at one of his private estates. The great expanse of the lawn, this is behind the estate uh, leading to the Connecticut River. Uh, in the spring, this is loaded as you may know with daffodils so that people in the home could enjoy that wonderful pastoral experience out the back. Curving paths everywhere. Uh, I was with a group of, of gardeners here yesterday at these wonderful Olmsted planted uh, uh, evergreens in, in the Pinetum. But again, curving paths, you're not gonna see everything in one shot because Olmsted is encouraging you to walk along the path to see what's behind it. Just a place of spectacular beauty. You know that um, everyone today is trying to take care of these Olmsted era trees by, if you see, noting that very wide drip line, uh, reducing the lawn uh, to make the tree happier. Uh, that is uh, one of the oaks that uh, Olmsted planted. Many people don't go on the far end of the uh, arboretum. And this is where Olmsted designed it to make you feel like you were walking in the Adirondacks. 
You see the fences, you see the bridges over waterways. Again, you forget that you are on, if you will, uh, 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 on Long Island, and maybe you're, you're someplace else far away. And it ends, this path ends in what was Mrs. Cutting's tea house. This was rebuilt recently uh, to look like the Adirondack style uh, 1887 tea house that Olmsted had fashioned. We're now near to the end of the, uh, his architectural, his landscape architectural career. It was Olmsted who got the job at the great Columbian exposition in Chicago. While it was Daniel Burnham who would do all of the architecture, Olmsted had all the landscape architecture and had hoped that the whole field of landscape architecture would be considered serious as a result of everyone taking a look at what was happening in the design of these buildings and um, the uh, landscape architecture. Today, we know that area as Jackson Park, the, the remnants of, of the Columbian Exposition and would enjoy it today, uh, much as we might have in the 1890s. It is true that Olmsted was aware that he was, quote, artificially constructing this scenery, but he knew that it would become more beauty, more beautiful with age, as it certainly has in every one of his parks. But he was also cognizant of the fact that there could be threats to the public nature of his parks. He said, I don't want anybody, you know, conducting horse races in them. I don't want people putting a smallpox hospital in the park. And importantly, I don't want people putting businesses in them. And he was particularly concerned about Central Park because it was such a commercial city that he thought that people might start putting businesses somewhere in them. Well, I think he can rest easily about uh, this park in Manhattan. But not so of other parks. We're back here at Franklin Park in Boston. Look at the uh, hospital that was sited right on the edge of the park. Um, this is slated to come down, uh, I believe, within the next year or two, but that has been there for a good 50 years. Some of you may know that Robert Moses wanted to reduce the ramble. That was the area in Central Park to build a senior center and connect it with all kinds of walkways. It was thanks to Autobahn groups in the New York area that got Moses, you know, that shot down Moses's project. And indeed the ramble remains the wonderful wooded meandering place that it is today. But it's probably true that what Moses was famous for, finding a way to connect people with cars that would have an impact on the parkways that Olmsted designed. Top area is we're looking at um, uh, the same image in Buffalo then and then below now. You can see the houses are the same, but certainly not the way to get from one place to another in the city. I'm, I showed you this photo earlier. Uh, we're in Boston. Um, this was the headquarters of Sears and Roebuck. If you've had a Sears and Roebuck catalog, this is where your merchandise that you ordered would be fulfilled from. But check out what happened. Sears decided that its employees needed more parking, so they just paved right over the river and put in a parking lot to accommodate all of their employees. So it was thanks to groups that came forward to form conservancies that, that uh, uh, went away and it has been redug as part of the river. Olmsted takeaways. I think Olmsted's urban parks have become a model for so many, not only in the United States, but around the world. And I think he helped us define what we think of as public spaces. You know, when I was in Prospect Park uh, taking photos and I saw this kid up in the tree, I said to myself, I'm sure that kid is on his cell phone. But maybe 40 years ago, he would have been sitting up there with a comic book and enjoying his comic book. And I said, that's a perfect statement of what Olmsted had hoped his urban parks would be, a place where anyone would feel comfortable to
to relax and indeed enjoy themselves. In some ways, I think he informs the Green Belt movement that has spread around the world. He, yes, has informed uh, the importance of drainage for public health and sanitation. And some of you may know the work of Richard Louvre, I think in some way uh, that informs his whole idea that children today are so deprived of nature, they have a nature deficit disorder and the prescription is to put them out back into nature. So that brings to a conclusion our understanding of what Olmsted's legacy is of building parks that are both works of art and that are wonderfully enjoyed by the public. I think we would be a very different America today were it not for his influence. And I encourage all of you to go to the Olmsted 200 uh, webpage and you'll see what other Olmsted talks or events you might be able to uh, participate in throughout the country. Um, these are terrific books. If you want to uh, sit in an armchair, either Charles Beveridge's, Frederick Law Olmsted, or Justin Martin's Genius of Place are excellent choices. You might want to go to the Olmsted archives. There's a great deal in the National Historic Site, as well as the National Association of Olmsted Parks. More information uh, uh, to keep you entertained on a wintry day. So that brings to conclusion my talk on a walk through some of Olmsted Parks. I'm about to segue back to join you all in the gallery. This is the moment, if you like, to open up your video, to open up your audio, and we can have a conversation about the legacy of Frederick Law Olmsted. Well, that was wonderful, Roxanne. Thank you so much. It's uh, it, it, He must have traveled quite a bit and he must have <laughs> gone back and forth, right? I mean, they these were probably some decades long projects, right? I mean, it, you know, you and I know that Central Park is still a work in progress in some sense. He was starting Prospect Park and opening Prospect Park about 10 or 13 years after they were still working on, but pretty much completed Central Park and was getting bids from other cities all across the United States uh, to do work. So very energetic, you know, very engaged and would have other collaborators in other cities. So it wasn't always Olmsted and Vox, but other people uh, in other towns. Uh, if I may make a comment, if we had, if I had been making this presentation 25 or 30 years ago and gone to these parks and taken photos, they would not be as attractive as I think they are now. Why? Conservancy. Olmsted, I, finances, right? It's, it's finances. Olmsted had relied on the monies that the various towns and cities had provided him. But you and I know that by the 1960s and 70s, when there were fiscal problems in cities, what was the first budget to get cut? Parks oh. and recreation. And so it was thanks to the public private citizens who were able to form conservancies that enabled Central Park and Prospect Park and all the parks in the Emerald Necklace to indeed provide money, resources, staffing, and insight to keep the parks as beautiful and handsome as they are now. Because if we were relying on city budgets to do so, my, my slides just wouldn't look so great because the park could probably be something of a mess. You know, when I was talking to the one of the Greens guys, he said, yeah, we're trying to get rid of the invasive, invasive species that somebody planted, you know, 40 and 50 and 60 and 70 years ago. So they're trying to do that. But more than anything else, they're trying to keep the park healthy, you know, a, a fairly decent working ecosystem. Roxanne, you did a wonderful job with this. And it's- I, 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 I just wanted to say, I don't I, have any- I don't well, can, we, can we raise hands? That might be better. And if you want to put on your, your video, anybody? And, and, uh, okay. Uh, Rick? I don't have a comment, really, other than to say I'm so thankful. This really brought back memories of my childhood when I, as a kid, I would take my bike on a Sunday and, and bike up Ocean Parkway to Prospect Park 
and drive around Central pa uh, Prospect Park and, and visit the zoo as a kid by myself. I mean, I think those days really instilled my love of nature. And of course, Central Park as a young man. And I remember though you talked about that stairway going down curving to the left to the Wagner landing. Oh. That reminded me so much of the Mohunk Preserve upstate. I mean, like it really, all his stuff really does remind you of the Adirondacks. And that, that's all I wanted to say. So just thank you. Oh, yeah, thank, thanks, Rick. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, and I do think there's a sense of freedom. I mean, I was watching kids running around both Central Park and Prospect Park, and their parents were, were mindful of where they were, but, but there was a sense of they could roam. You know, there was a sense of freedom there. Now, I'm sorry, Louise, you were- I, I went alone. <laughs> okay. Back then, a kid could go alone. <laughs> yeah, 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 on, on a bike. Yeah. Louise, Um, Roxanne, you did an absolutely wonderful job. It's very scholarly and very entertaining, um, and you're a great presenter. The photographs are beautiful. Thank you. Um, when, when I was growing up, uh, yeah, Central Park was in decline, um, and by the late 1970s, it was uh, dangerous and decrepit, and uh, it was around the mid-1980s, uh, the Central Park Conservancy was formed, and um, they took great care to go back to original drawings and, um, and find uh, pieces that had been broken but stored and then recreate uh, um, finials for fence posts and uh, the, bring back the designs for the benches and the Belvedere fountain and open up um, the the uh, the dairy barn and the uh, there were all of these features that they were, one by one were able to bring back the glory of it all, and then the plantings uh, followed, and yeah, it's a spectacular place today. And uh, the the thing is, like the pro, I was thinking about the projects that that we we don't like that um, Robert Moses undertook and in addition to all the ones that we marvel at that he undertook and the projects of recreating what was uh, the center part of Manhattan into Central Park could not be done today, not just because of the finances available, mm -hmm. but because of the social justice issues. Um, well-heeled New Yorkers and I guess those in Boston and other places could bully their way through and around um, the situations of the less fortunate. And uh, their Central Park was filled with squatters. Um, they lived there. It was their home. It was <laughs> it's called they, Seneca, I believe Seneca Village. And so they got um, they got really they got removed and uh, the kinds of things that we are coming around to, to try to work on today. Um, they gum up the works and uh, not that there's that much land available to do these kinds of uh, par, uh, recreation, um, recreations anymore, but uh, we do look at things much differently now uh, for sure. It, it, just one more thing, which is that I was greatly personally, like, like Rick did, I was um, I personally benefited from the legacy of uh, Frederick Law Olmsted because his son um, teamed up with um, Calvert Vox and Grosvenor Atterbury to create um, the, the dream that was Mrs. Russell Sage's um, and, and create Forest Hills Gardens. Mm -hmm. And Forest Hills Gardens was the first planned community on the East Coast. It came through the Garden City movement. And um, it's where my mother was born and where I grew up. And so being able to walk through curving streets with mature, we lost all the elms in the early 1960s, but walk through curving streets, have green uh, open spaces, um, beautiful stonework, and, um, yeah. and the house is all sort of down to a human scale uh, with parkland and open spaces being the priority. Um, really affected a sense of place, a sense of neighborhood. Uh, you knew who your neighbors were, the kids ran free, and, uh, you know, it was a real privilege 
to, to have that. And I, I thank all of these visionaries for that. Yeah, and, and it's taken some time, I think, for us to understand the importance that this represented. You know, it's kind of in the background. As a kid, I don't know if you understood what it was that you were doing or, or that Rick understood why he was enjoying, you know, just riding his bike around uh, Prospect Park. Uh, it, it's sort of invisible, but certainly now we can look back and say, oh my God, how, how fortunate we were, how valuable these spaces are and remain. Absolutely true. And my, my friends and I have, who have scattered like, you know, to the four winds, we, we stay in touch and we all um, marvel at how lucky we were to grow up in, in such a place. And you can go back today and the architecture has been, um, it holds up to, to, to time. Um, and it, uh, it's that sense of, of lasting, uh, lasting architecture that makes you, it gives you a sense of continuity and constancy and um, yeah, just a place that isn't always in, in some kind of tumultuous change like the rest of New York City. The only thing that changes is the trees have gotten much bigger um, <laughs> and they're much more beautiful than they ever were. You know, I'm curious, how is it that those Dutch elms, does anyone know how Dutch elms have been spared? I, there weren't any spared in Forest Hills, but I don't know how they did it in Central, Central Park. Park. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there are just a couple of comments in the chat. Um, let's see, I'm gonna start from the beginning. Sharon said, thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. I have to join another meeting. Such a wonderful talk. Thank you from Berenbaum. Ellen Rubin, wonderful talk. Thanks so much, Rexanne. Uh, thank you from Conrad and he, relays that he spent many happy hours in Central Park and Prospect Park. And they came back as you talked. And Gail says, May is the best month for migrating birds in the ramble. I have a quick Thank question. You. Yeah. Uh, so Greenwood Cemetery is considered uh, arboretum, is it not? Or, and it seems to be a place where people still gather. You know, the, the older cemeteries in the United States were these places where people would gather. So, I mean, I don't know if we call them technically arboreta, but they're typically a lot of trees and shrubs there uh, because it was a place of refuge, a place yeah, of- Yeah, it, it was. It, it was where people went on a Sunday, which was uh, the Germans started that, and they used to go for picnics. At, at, during uh, during to the cemeteries, and they would take the whole family and have a big picnic in the cemetery, and that 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 was considered getting out into the outdoors, and that's what people did back then. It wasn't considered rude or anything like that. It was just utilizing the open space that was available. I, I think open they still the public. have programs. Actually, oh, they, they may, they may, they may. Yeah, yeah, yeah I. I um, the other thing I just wanted to comment on about parks, and we see, we're seeing it today in Suffolk County parks, we have some wonderful parks, but as you said, park seems to be the one that always sort of gets you know, the ax when it comes to budget. So, um, you know, if you know of any groups, particularly um, North Fork Audubon were the stewards of Inlet Pond Park, but there are many parks across uh, Suffolk County that are in need of TLC. So if, if there's any group or, um, you know, that the uh, county is willing to work with folks to help maintain parks and trails and things like that. So, um, but thank you so much. Does anybody have anything else they'd like to add before we, we sign off? I, well, thank you, Roxanne. It was wonderful. And thank anybody you. that would, um, we'll send out the link. Uh, once we have it up on YouTube, it'll take a few days, uh, but you can watch this presentation again. It's been my pleasure to be here. Good night, everyone. Good night.